The very first piece of animation that Hayao Miyazaki is credited with directing is this, the seventh episode of the original Lupin III 1971 TV show. Halfway through production, he and Aiso Takahata took the reins from director Masayaki Osumi, leaving the two of them to run the production for the remainder of the series. When that series was finished, Hayao went on to spend most of the 1970s working with Takahata on a number of other TV series and a few original short films of his own creation. He ended the decade directing his very first TV series, this time without Takahata's involvement at all, in the 1978 anime Future Boy Conan. Then, in 1979, he went back to the Loop on the Third franchise for his first feature film in the wildly successful Castle of Cagliostro. Following this, Miyazaki went and directed two episodes of the second Loop on the Third series, wrote the Nausicaa and the Valley of the Wind manga, directed a few episodes of Sherlock Hound, and then went back to features directing the Nausicaa and the Valley of the Wind movie, which, like Cagliostro, was a huge success. Following those two hits, Hayao teamed up with ISO and created Studio Ghibli. At their studio, he directed Castle in the Sky, My Neighbor Totoro, Kiki's Delivery Service, Porco Rosso, the music video On Your Mark, Princess Mononoke, Spirited Away, a bunch of short films that you can't watch unless you go to the Ghibli Museum in Japan, Howl's Moving Castle, Ponyo, and his final film for the fourth time, The Wind Rises. Looking back at this 50-plus year-long career of animation, you'll be struck at the quality Miyazaki has maintained for all those decades, and how now, even in the dismal 2020s, this 82-year-old grandpa can utilize all that history, all that knowledge, all that technical skill that he has acquired over the years to create another amazing 2D animated masterpiece. His latest feature carries with it the legacy of all that he's made before, and I had the extreme fortune to be in the first audience outside of Japan to watch that film, The Boy and the Heron, or How Do You Live? And I'd like to offer some of my spoiler-free comments about my experience with the movie. However, this film has very intentionally been given almost no marketing or promotion whatsoever, so if you prefer to know absolutely nothing at all, I'd leave now. Even still, there's a lot about the boy and the heron that you could probably assume on your own without me having to tell you. Yes, every single frame of it is a beautiful painting. Yes, the movement of the characters and the momentum of the world is breathtaking. Yes, every single female character is strong as hell. Yes, there are a bunch of scenes of things flying through the air or gliding through the water. Yes, it does that thing where it shows a beautifully detailed background and then moves laterally across it so you can see the whole image. Yes, there are several fantastical scenes stunningly realized in a bunch of creatively inventive ways. Yes, there are themes about living harmoniously with nature, the importance of family, the human cost of war, the transition of childhood to adulthood. And yes, don't worry, even though the setting doesn't really call for it, Miyazaki still found an excuse to draw parts of an airplane. There is so much about The Boy and the Heron that feels like Miyazaki running through his greatest hits, and this is probably why so much of the conversation is focused around the ways this film parallels so many ideas and sequences that he has shown before. If you care to look online, you can already see how a few scenes in the only currently released trailer mirror scenes from his other films. But with this said, I still ended up finding The Boy and the Heron to be one of the most unique films Miyazaki's ever made. Again, no spoilers, but the film is sort of what you would get if you put every Miyazaki movie in a blender with some heavy leanings and dispirited away. That's my favorite movie of all time, so you can imagine how I felt watching this film that reminded me so much of it. At the start of the movie, I was almost so comfortable with the spirited away connection that I half convinced myself that this would end up being a sort of spiritual successor to that film. But as should be expected, Hayao Miyazaki did something creatively unexpected and it resulted in a film that was consistently surprising me in ways that I never would have guessed from someone who's been a huge fan of his work for so long. Like, this is the only Miyazaki film that I can genuinely say is probably improved upon by a second watch. There's a lot of distance he puts between the audience and his characters this time around with an especially muted first act, and it makes for a film that is asking way more of the people watching it than any of his other features. You may not believe me when I say this, but I actually got a vibe similar to the works of Satoshi Kon while watching The Boy and the Heron. The supernatural elements of the film is ultimately explained in the end, but this is only in the literal last moments of the movie, and even then there is plenty left to interpretation far more than you would expect from someone like Miyazaki. 
Similar to Satoshi Kon's work, the supernatural stuff just kind of happens in The Boy and the Heron, flowing into and out of scenes suddenly and often unremarked upon. In fact, there's very few moments in the film where Miyazaki provides any real context beyond his character's expression and their body language to showcase pivotal emotional sequences. That might be a problem if he wasn't the world's greatest animator, but in his hands it provides so many moments of small, indistinct humanity that you rarely think about but so often see in people's movements and presence. The Boy and the Heron is far less explicit than any of his other films in terms of its messaging, and the whole piece lends itself to the sleepy, dreamlike quality that Khan so frequently stamped his films with. There's no doubt in my mind that come December 8th, YouTube is going to get filled with the Boy and the Heron ending explained videos. And again, I can't really say most of Miyazaki's other films would be viewed in such a way. A somewhat big deal has been made over the English translation of the title, but I have to say, having watched the film, it does actually make a lot of sense that they decide to call it The Boy and the Heron and not How Do You Live. In 2017, the film was announced as an adaptation of the 1937 novel How Do You Live, and this actually resulted in a huge amount of renewed interest in that book because of the announcement. I'm sure some of those people will end up disappointed, though, because in almost no way is the film an adaptation of that novel, and the title is really the only thing that they share. Which is probably exactly why they decided to not have it be given the same name as Yoshino's book Outside of Japan, since that's just inviting confusion from people unaware of the novel or the film's history. Having it be called something else entirely makes sense to me, especially when considering the full context of the film. This is the only actual spoiler I'll give, and it's a fairly innocuous one, but at one point in the film, the main character actually reads the novel How Do You Live, and I could see why that might be a bit weird for people who thought it was going to be an actual adaptation of that book. Most adaptations don't feature the thing they're adapting within the adaptation itself. Furthermore, a not small amount of shade has been given to the chosen English title, The Boy and the Heron. But again, having watched the film and understanding its full context, I actually did grow to like that title quite a bit. There's a lot in the story that justifies it being called that, and there's even a few provocative ideas that are expressed just from that being the title alone, all the way until the actual final shot of the movie. And hey, maybe it's just me personally, but I don't really like movie titles that are also full sentences. Feels weird. Broadly though, Miyazaki's How Do You Live is about what else? Death. And he spends the film using the many tools at his disposal, including his entire filmography, to showcase the things he's been thinking about when it comes to his untimely demise. Not just his own death, mind you, but the death of those who mean the most to him. The death of the world we're currently living in. The fear of death, the desire for death, the very conceptual idea of death itself. Miyazaki puts a lot on his shoulders in this film, and it's a testament to his abilities as an animator to craft something that ultimately appears so deft and flawless while dealing with something so heavy. This is Miyazaki reckoning with his legacy even more so than he did in 2013's The Wind Rises. And despite that film being a visually stunning, cumulative masterpiece made by the greatest animator currently living, I always felt that The Wind Rises suffered from its commitment to be sort of an actual biopic. That sense of realism, or at least as much realism as Miyazaki would allow, ended up putting a limiter on his greatest strength, his endless wellspring of creativity. Boring, normal reality is just too small to fit in all that Miyazaki wants to create, and thank God the boy in the heron fully and completely steps into the fantasy. It gives the film the same quality all of his best films have, in my opinion. The sense that you could really see anything at any point, and what you're going to see is something totally brand new. That spark of endless potential that you only get from movies that are truly audacious, truly special, truly memorable. I know the boy in the heron has been very pointedly released, with virtually no advertising to give everyone the chance to go into it with fresh eyes, but speaking from someone who has seen the film and who didn't see the one-minute trailer released by G-Kids before, I can say that it really doesn't spoil anything. In fact, I think it's actually a pretty good trailer that honors the commitment to give people no pre-existing expectations and also effectively translates the overall mood and tone of the film. There's something so much darker and confrontational about this movie than anything else Miyazaki has made before, 
and it paves the way for some incredible juxtaposition once he falls back into the wholesome optimism for what she's known for. Had any other person made this film, it would be heralded as an industry-shaking masterpiece. And given how shitty the North American and Japanese animation industry has become, both of them could definitely use it. But because this is Miyazaki, and because at least on the outset, he's steeping this film in so many ideas he's explored already, I feel some are not going to give in to the deeper exploration Miyazaki is asking from his audience this time around. Don't get me wrong, it's still a kid's film, the main character is 12 years old, and that's who I would say is about the recommended audience for the film as well, but there are elements of The Boy and the Heron that are far more mature than some of his other movies. Not to the extent of The Wind Rises or some of his more overt political leanings like in Porco Rosso, but definitely around the same level as something like Princess Mononoke. Like that film, it's the only other Miyazaki movie that depicts violence with some amount of realism. If you want a quick age guideline, that's the best I can offer. If your kid can handle seeing someone get decapitated with a bow and arrow, then there's really nothing in this film that's inappropriate for them. Speaking personally, especially because of my love for Spirited Away, which I watched at a very young age, I can say that if I watched this film at the time in my life when I first saw that film, I would probably end up loving it and obsessing about it even more than I did Spirited Away. For a film that keeps you at a distance for so long, I found myself having such an emotional reaction to one of its slightest moments in the final act, and I can't imagine anyone who's been on board the Miyazaki cat bus for this long isn't going to find something in this movie to cherish. There's just so much that can be said about The Boy and the Heron, so much that I would love to talk about, but sadly can't without spoiling it, and honestly without watching it again to make sure I got everything. So, I should probably end this video here. Consider these comments just some of my initial impressions of the film. If it wasn't obvious, I loved it. And let me be clear that unless Hayao Miyazaki somehow makes another movie before the end of the year, it's going to be my favorite one of 2023, and maybe even the entire decade. The world of animation is awful and films are by and large completely worthless. Everything that everyone is working towards doing in the entertainment industry is evil and vapid and narcissistic and serves nothing more than to fill the coat pockets of some of the most wretched people who have ever existed in the history of the planet. Over the last few years, after facing so many, many, many disappointments about the reality in which so many films are made and the purpose that they ultimately serve, it can be very defeating to even try to care about art and the modern world. At some point, I know I lost that initial enthusiasm. That enthusiasm I had when I was first discovering great films. Great films like Spirited Away. There are very few movies now that give me that same spark of creativity, that same passion for artistic expression, that same desire to explore everything that was done to create an art piece and revel in it because its execution is so monumental and life-changing that you just can't stop yourself from knowing everything about it. Hayao Miyazaki was one of the very first filmmakers to ever give me that feeling. And with The Boy and the Heron, he did it again. I can't wait until everyone else gets to see it. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you watch the next one too. Goodbye.